So I'm just going to go over a little bit of just basically what prion disease is, what a prion is. So a prion is, stands for a, a protein that's infectious. Um, most infectious organisms have DNA or RNA, what we call nucleic acids. Um, and prions are unusual in that they're transmissible, but they don't have any DNA and RNA. So they're kind of a group all into themselves. And they're not degradable by typical sterilization, so in order to uh, sterilize, you have to use specific procedures. And the way prion disease work is that we all have normal prion proteins, that's the yellow PRPC uh, that we have in our body. Most of it's in our brain, some of it's in our stomach. Uh, we don't know exactly what it does, but it probably has some housekeeping function uh, in the brain. And we all have that. And then for whatever reason, we come across an infectious PRPSC, which stands for scrapey protein. That's the prion uh, protein that causes the disease comes in contact with the normal prion protein and then it converts the normal prion protein into itself in kind of this autocatalytic cycle. So in order to have prion disease, you need to have PRPC or normal prion proteins. And this is important specifically for Dr. Collins' talk tomorrow when he talks about uh, his treatment study and the importance of blocking PRPC. So just keep that in mind. Uh, once you have the abnormal prion proteins, they tend to aggregate and form seeds, and then they cause things like oligomers and fibrils, and you get this kind of uh, exponential curve that you see where you get rapid spreading. So that's what happens at the molecular level. If you look at the brain tissue, uh, you can look at it in a variety of ways. One of the ways is called H&E staining, where the brain develops these holes or vacuoles, which gave it its original terminology of a spongiform encephalopathy because the brain resembles spongy tissue. And then you can also do immunohistochemistry and take an antibody that binds to the abnormal prion protein and stain for that. And that's what those uh, brown uh, deposits are in the right-hand slide um, is the abnormal prion protein itself. So when someone goes for autopsy, at the surveillance center, both of these are done, and that's how we screen for prion disease in brains. So animals also have prion diseases. In sheep and goat, they have a um, prion disease called scrapie, which came about because one of the uh, symptoms that sheep and goat get is they get this itching, and it causes them to scratch up against the surfaces. And then cows get something called bovine spongiform encephalopathy, uh, what is sometimes referred to as mad cow disease. And then in the U.S., we have um, something called chronic wasting disease, which is a very unusual prion disease that affect deer, elk, moose, and caribou. And at the end of the talk, I'm going to talk specifically about CWD and why we care about it specifically uh, as family members and also scientifically, especially in the U.S. So if you look at the epidemiology or the occurrence of CJD in, in the American population, and actually across the world, um, the one statistic that's usually thrown out is the one per million statistic. And this is something called an incidence. And what it means is that uh, there's one new case per million individuals per year across the entire population. But as we'll learn later, not everyone gets CJD. In fact, it's usually a mid to late life illness. Um, and some people live longer than a year. So that statistic, whereas it's important for public health, because that's how you look at uh, incidences of the disease, uh, psychologically it makes it sound like it's uh, much rarer than perhaps what it is. So perhaps a, uh, a better way of framing how common the disease is is to look at how many deaths per year uh, occur in the U.S. due to prion disease or CJD. And if you look at that statistics, it's about one in every six to one in every 10,000 US, U.S. deaths are due to prion disease. So that's not a common disease, but it certainly is maybe not as rare as that one in a million number may initially uh, make you think. So when you go to your legislators on Monday, I would advocate that you use uh, the one in 10,000 deaths per year of CJD as opposed to the, the incidence numbers of one in a million, because most people aren't going to realize what an incidence is. Um, so to take an example of Ohio, we have about 10 and a half million people. So if you look at the incidence, we would expect about 10 and a half new cases per year. 
uh, as we'll talk about later, about 25% of cases live longer than a year. So you would have about two and a half cases um, carried over from the year before. So if you look at kind of a low estimate, it wouldn't be unusual and actually be expected to have 13 active cases in Ohio uh, alone at any given time. So again, this is not a common disease, but I think it's uh, much more common than people might think, again, from that one in a million number. If you look at the causes of prion disease, most people, especially in the medical community and in the media, know it to be an acquired illness, uh, mostly from um, the BSE epidemic or mad cow epidemic. But in fact, the vast majority of human prion diseases are due to sporadic illness. And what we mean by sporadic illness is we think what happens is the normal prion protein sometimes uh, undergoes a spontaneous misfolding on its own and converts into the abnormal prion protein. It starts that autocatalytic cycle that we talked about in the first couple slides. But it's not acquired from an infection that we know of. It's not genetic. It seems to happen on its own accord. So that's about 85% of cases. Uh, about 10 to 15% are due to what we call genetic etiologies. And that could be genetic CJD, fatal familial insomnia, or GSS. And I'll talk specifically about what those different genetic prion diseases are later. And then by far the least common cause of prion disease are the acquired forms. And that's well under 1%. And that includes things like Kuru, iatrogenic CJD, and variant CJD, which we'll talk about in detail later. So if you look at the age of onset of the disease, it tends to be a disease of middle to late life. But if you break it down by etiology, you do see certain um, peaks. And that is variant CJD in general tends to occur in much younger people. So people in their teens, 20s, and 30s. Uh, genetic CJD tends to occur more in mid midlife, like 50s and 60s. And then sporadic CJD tends to be more of a, a later life illness uh, with a mean age of onset of about 62. But it's important to remember that there's a lot of variation in between this. So for example, we've seen sporadic CJD in people as young as uh, 13 or 14. And we've seen variant CJD in people as old as 50. So, um, you know, this is just a generalization. There's a lot of variability within it. The oldest in the US was 98. Sporadic, yeah. Um, so if you look at how, how long people survive with prion disease, as you well unfortunately all know, it's a very quick illness. Uh, the vast majority of people pass within one year. <laughs> Uh, but there are some cases that live longer than a year, about a quarter. Some of them can live two, three years, but again, that's unusual. The vast majority will pass away within four to six months um, of the symptoms starting. And many of you are well aware of the symptoms of CJD. What you may not be well aware of is that CJD can present in a variety of different ways. So, in fact, people very rarely present with what we would call the classic CJD uh, presentation, which would be uh, cognitive problems or dementia, problems walking and steadiness, and the myoclonus or the jerkin movements. Uh, that's only going to be a presentation in a very small sub subset of people. A lot of people will just present with cognitive problems. So they may be misdiagnosed as having uh, Alzheimer's disease or another form of dementia. Some may affect with very sudden visual changes and may be misdiagnosed as having stroke. Uh, some may just present with uh, what we call ataxia or an unsteady gait um, and be misdiagnosed as something else. So um, in general, the rule that I have is there's no rule in how CJD can present. Uh, we've certainly seen a variety of different presentations. But at least as time goes on, they tend to look very similar. Uh, but of course, you don't have that luxury in the beginning of the illness. So diagnosing CJD, it's, it's a clinical diagnosis in life. Uh, the only way to definitively diagnose it is by looking at the brain tissue, uh, preferably at autopsy. And we do this by looking at the clinical symptoms. So may, most patients will have dementia. Uh, many will have myoclonus, or that's the twitches that we talked about. They'll have cerebellar or visual symptoms. So cerebellar symptoms are unsteady gait, almost like a drunken walking or they may have incoordination. 
Um, and visual symptoms can be a variety of things like visual hallucinations or it could be a, a depth mis misperception. Uh, they can have uh, weakness and tremors and sometimes even have Parkinson's-like symptoms of um, kind of a shuffling gait. And then at the very end of the disease, uh, people reach a state of what's called akinetic mutism, which is a lack of voluntary speech and movement. Unfortunately, rather nonspecific because you see this in most end stages of dementia, um, but you typically do see this in most cases of CJD towards the end. And then we use a variety of different diagnostic tests that we'll go about uh, in detail after this. One of them is called the uh, electroencephalogram, or EEG, which looks at brain waves. And there's a finding called periodic sharp wave complexes that can be suggestive of CJD. And I'll show you an example of that. And then there's a variety of different uh, spinal fluid tests that can be done. Uh, the WHO classification, World Health Organization classification, only includes one of them currently, called 1433, but a variety of other different spinal fluid tests are also now used, and we'll talk about them. And then the brain MRI also can be suggestive of CJD by having um, different abnormalities in different areas of the brain on a very specific sequence called diffusion-weighted imaging. And I'll show you an example of that as well. So this is an example of periodic sharp wave complexes um, on an EEG. Uh, EEGs, I agree with Richard, we were talking about this at the last session, um, have become kind of unhelpful in the diagnosis of CJD currently, but it is important to rule out other things like seizures, uh, so we still use that. Uh, this is an example of a brain MRI of a patient with sporadic CJD. Uh, the specific sequences that we like to look at is, ca is called diffusion-weighted imaging, and that's done on most MRIs nowadays. Um, and we look at two specific areas in CJD. One is the basal ganglia, or the middle part of the brain, um, and that tends to show brightness. Or it could be the outside part of the brain called the cortex in kind of this cortical ribboning pattern. Uh, and this can be quite suggestive of CJD in the appropriate clinical context, meaning that the patient looks like they have symptoms of CJD and other things have been ruled out. I think uh, in some cases the brain MRI is sometimes the, the first initial suggestion of CJD. Um, so one case that we had many years ago uh, was a case from DC that presented to us for suspected CJD. And uh, I examined him and he was you know, pretty normal. Uh, he had a normal uh, memory testing, his exam was normal, and then we looked at his MRI, and this is actually his MRI. Um, his only complaint was he used to do yoga, and he could only do headstands for two minutes every morning, whereas before he could do it five minutes. Um, and the only reason he had gotten an MRI was because he had been in a bike race, and he fell off and hit his head, um, and the neurologist ordered a brain scan, and this is what happened. So, of course, this is a case of someone who had an MRI that looked like prion disease and a patient who did not look like they had prion disease. Um, and this was how the suspicion arose. And then we followed the patient over time, and they, they did develop prion disease and passed two months later. Um, so in certain circumstances, I think this has led to um, an earlier diagnosis in some cases when clinicians may not have suspected the disease. So in that regard, I think it's been helpful. And then there are a variety of different spinal fluid tests. There's two spinal fluid tests that we use that are kind of just markers of brain cell damage. And that's 1433, which at the surveillance center is generally reported as positive, negative, or ambiguous. And then we have the total tau protein, which is reported as a, a number. So you could have a, a, a tau protein level of one, or it could be in the tens of thousands. And in general, um, the higher the number, sometimes the more suggestive of CJD it can be in the right patient. Uh, but these are only markers of brain cell damage, so they can be elevated in other conditions. So for example, people that have seizures, uh, MS, uh, brain tumors, head injury, they can all have elevated uh, markers of brain cell damage. So it's not very specific for prion disease itself. And then we recently started using a very disease-specific test called real-time quaking-induced conversion uh, otherwise known as real-time quick, which actually detects the abnormal prion protein itself. So it's kind of the first disease-specific uh, 
marker that we have. And you're gonna hear a lot about that in the conference this weekend um, and people doing this test on a variety of different uh, tissues. So Dr. Zanuso will talk about using it on nasal epithelium and Dr. Zhu will talk about using it on skin. Uh, so it will pop up a lot. And it's very specific for the disease itself because it looks at the abnormal protein. And the way it works is they take a plate with normal prion proteins in it, and then they take a sample that presumably has abnormal prion protein in it, and then they label it with what's called thioflavin T, and put it for lack of a better term, a shake and bake oven. Sorry to Dr. Rhodes that I just described it as that. But, um, and what will happen is it kind of um, exploits that prion paradigm where it converts normal prion proteins into abnormal prion proteins and you start getting aggregation of these proteins that the star um, fluorescent binds to and then you can see that and that's a positive test and it lets you know that there's presence of abnormal prion proteins in there. Now the reason why it's rather specific is we would not expect to see any abnormal prion proteins uh, in any other condition. So that's its power. Uh, and then when we talk about different diagnostic tests, we often talk about things like sensitivity and specificity. And sensitivity is how good a test is at detecting a specific disease. Um, and generally, and that's not a specific problem in our field because uh, we have a lot of uh, tests that have relatively high sensitivity. It's the specificity that um, until fairly recently has been a problem. And specificity is how sure you are that the disease you're trying to detect is the actual disease that you're trying to detect. So in RT Quick, um, the sensitivity is high at 95% and, and uh, relatively almost 100% specific for the disease because we wouldn't expect it in anything else. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the difference between the Surveillance Center and the Mayo Clinic because I know some families have had uh, specimens sent to both and with different results. So uh, the tests are done differently uh, from a lab standpoint. And also when you send the specimen to the Mayo Clinic, the physician has to actually order specific tests. So they have to know to order 1433. And if they want tau, they have to know to order that. And a lot of clinicians may not know um, that tau could be helpful in their diagnosis, so it's not ordered. Uh, RT Quick is also only available at the Prion Surveillance Center. Uh, so if that went to Mayo, you're not going to get the RT quick. Uh, one of the benefits of receiving spinal fluid at the surveillance center is, in essence, patients or clinicians don't really need to know what they're ordering. They just need to know that there's a suspicion of prion disease, and then we automatically do all three tests. So that can be helpful for the clinicians. The other helpful thing is that if we have a positive test, then um, we have people that will contact the clinician saying um, that we have this autopsy program that I believe uh, you're going to hear about in detail on Sunday. Um, that's funded through the CDC. So I just wanted to end a little bit on sporadic CJD, talking about sporadic CJD molecular subtypes, because you'll hear about this and it's very confusing. So uh, sporadic CJD has different molecular subtypes that behave in different manners. And the reason why we care about that is because it looks differently on the brain tissue. It may look differently clinically. Um, and also the diagnostic tests may be different. Um, and generally you'll hear these terms thrown around like MM1, MM2, VV2. And what that refers to is those first two letters are uh, what's called a polymorphism at a specific part of the prion protein gene that's kind of like a flavor that we all have. So we all could have one of three flavors. We could have MM, MV, or VV. And uh, these sometimes dictate the course of the disease and what they look like clinically and neuropathologically. So we take those two letters and we also uh, match it with the prion protein type that's usually detected off a Western blot. And that's where you get the number from. So for example, a patient who has MM uh, polymorphism at codon 129 and a prion protein uh, of type 1 would be MM1. So just so you, if you hear these uh, you know, alphabet soup going around, that, that's what that refers to. Um, so we talk a little bit about genetic prion disease. Uh, the way genetic prion disease works is we all have a normal prion protein gene that makes 
normal prion proteins, but in some individuals there can be a mutation in that gene that in instead of allowing them to make normal prion protein, it allows them to make a mutated form of the prion protein that has a much higher chance of converting to the abnormal prion protein and then causing genetic prion disease. Um, so when people have genetic prion disease, their blood relatives have a 50-50 chance of also inheriting the mutation, but the likelihood of them developing the illness um, is something called penetrance. So not everyone who has a mutation will develop the disease. There are some people who will not. And penetrance means that it's the likelihood that you'll become ill with CJD if you have the mutation. And uh, this is from an, a very important paper that Eric Minical and a lot of other colleagues put together looking at different penetrance rates in different mutations. And what you can see is at the top of the table, uh, those are mutations that have very low penetrance. So, you know, they have, you know, maybe a 1%, 5% chance of developing the disease if they have the mutation. That's important to know if you're a family member uh, who's deciding on whether or not you want to be tested because you want to know what your risk is. As you would expect, the right-hand column where those red bars are reflects um, the percentage of people that had a positive family history. And if you have a mutation that has a low penetrance, logically, you're not going to have a lot of other family members that have become ill. Um, there are many mutations, unfortunately, in prion disease, though, towards the bottom, things like E200K or P102L, where the penetrance is quite high uh, and generally is associated with age, um, nearing 100%. But it's not the same penetrance level for every mutation. So. Um, if you belong to a genetic family, it's very important to know what the mutation is because that's going to reflect um, the likelihood of developing illness if you have it. So you want to make sure that, you'll have, that you have that information. So I talked about three different genetic prion diseases. Genetic CJD is kind of easy because uh, it's called that because it resembles sporadic CJD. Um, the most common mutation of genetic CJD is the E200K mutation. Uh, and a lot of the clinical symptoms and diagnostic tests that we use for sporadic CJD uh, are also positive in genetic CJD, although not always. Uh, there's another genetic prion disease called fatal familial insomnia, which is due to a very specific mutation. Uh, as the name denotes, uh, insomnia tends to be a prominent symptom, but you can also have very prominent neuropsychiatric symptoms of anxiety and hallucinations. And patients with FFI do develop cognitive issues, uh, but usually very late in the illness. Uh, so this is a uh, genetic prion disease that uh, sometimes doesn't really resemble uh, what we classically uh, think of as CJD. Uh, similarly, gerstmann strauchler schenker syndrome, or GSS, is due to several different mutations. It also looks very unlike most cases of sporadic CJD. Uh, mainly because the illness duration is much longer. Uh, so most patients with GSS can live about five years, sometimes up to 10 years. And uh, they typically either have a very early uh, cerebellar presentation, meaning that they have uh, incoordination or problems walking, or they may have an initial Parkinson's-like presentation where they have a shuffling slow gait. And then they typically don't develop other symptoms characteristic of prion disease until much later in the illness. Uh, so this is a genetic prion disease that if you don't know that you have it in your family, often will go undiagnosed until someone has uh, considered it a possibility in that family. And with FFI and GSS, a lot of the diagnostic tests that we use, um, like CSF tests, brain MRI, uh, they're often negative in these tests. So that also leads to difficulty in diagnosing these conditions. Moving on to acquired prion disease, uh, most people know the story of Kuru. Uh, it's happened in a tribe in Papua New Guinea where they um, partook in cannibalism as part of their death rituals. Uh, basically, probably what happened is uh, one individual developed CJD, uh, the loved ones consumed uh, brain tissue, uh, and then uh, continued to pass it generation to generation. So once cannibalism was ruled out, the incidence of uh, Kuru drastically uh, reduced, and uh, I don't think they have any case of Kuru in quite some time now. 
but Kuru is important because it really is what kind of uh, suggested that prion disease may be transmissible. Uh, and that led to the discovery of something called iatrogenic CJD. So iatrogenic means medically induced. So these are cases of CJD that are transmitted through very specific medical procedures. And these are things like uh, corneal transplants or neurosurgical instrumentation, but most commonly due to material taken from cadavers. So for example, human growth hormone uh, used to be taken from cadavers to treat uh, patients with uh, short stature. Uh, we don't do that anymore because we know of the risk of prion disease and fortunately we can also um, synthesize human growth hormone in the lab so we don't have to do that anymore. Um, also there's a covering of the brain called the dura matter that used to be um, taken from cadavers to cover holes in neurosurgeries and that also is no longer done because we can create that synthetically. Um, but we learned a lot from iatrogenic CJD in that sometimes the time from the exposure to the infection to the time that patients became ill can be quite extended, sometimes up to decades. Um, and just a general rule of thumb for acquired prion disease with one very specific exception is that in order to transmit prion disease, uh, prion material has to be taken uh, essentially from the central nervous system. And then it has to be introduced in another patient's central nervous system, injected into the body or in ingested in large quantities in order to transmit the, the disease. The one exception to this is variant CJD because we do know that variant CJD is a little different in that it resides outside uh, the CNS, specifically in things like the spleen, tonsils, and appendix, and uh, can actually be transmitted through blood. Um, but at least epidemiologically, there's only evidence that variant CJD uh, can be transmitted in that fashion. So variant CJD is uh, CJD in humans that's due to eating meat contaminated with bovine spongiform encephalopathy or mad cow disease. And it tends to be a young disease, so onsets typically in 20s or the 30s. And it has a little longer duration than classical sporadic CJD, often over a year. And their initial clinical presentation is a little different in that they tend to have more psychiatric symptoms and sensory symptoms at the beginning of their presentation. Oftentimes, uh, 1433 and EEGs are negative, uh, and they can have different brain MRI findings from what we typically see in sporadic CJD, something called the Palvener sign or hockey stick sign uh, that's uh, somewhat specific for variant as opposed to sporadic CJD. And then at least only in variant CJD, you can also do a tonsil biopsy to detect uh, the abnormal prion protein that causes variant CJD. But this is the only type of prion disease where you could do that uh, because it's unique in that mechanism that it resides outside the central nervous system. Uh, so if you look at the cases of variant CJD worldwide, the mad cow epidemic happened in the UK, so the majority of cases uh, of variant CJD have occurred in the UK, and then um, most others were in European countries. We've had four cases in the US, but all of them were thought to be acquired overseas, um, and I think probably Ryan Maddox from the CDC will talk a little bit more in detail about that on Sunday. Um, today we have a total of about 231 cases, uh, which is quite remarkable because uh, quite a number of people were exposed uh, to meat contaminated with BSE. Um, to have such a low number is, is, is fairly fortunate. Um, if you look at the uh, death rates of variant CJD in the UK over time, uh, the BSE epidemic happened in the 1980s, and then the peak death rate in the UK occurred about the year 2000 which leads us to believe that the mean incubation period, so time from exposure to uh, BSE to becoming ill, is about 10 years. Uh, and we've seen um, a very steady tail of cases after that, but uh, clearly the disease is in the decline, and I don't think there's anyone currently alive with suspected variant CJD, am I correct? Okay, so that's good, and haven't been for about a year now, right? Um, there is another a sticky point, however, with variant CJD, and that is although only 231 cases have occurred to date, uh, a lot of people were exposed to BSE. So the concern is, are there asymptomatic carriers of the infection 
who they themselves may or may not become ill, but also may or may not be transmissible to other people via things like blood transfusion. So the UK did a study that looked at um, many appendices, over 30,000, um, to look for the presence of the abnormal prion protein. And what they found was about 16 out of 32,000 uh, cases were positive for uh, variant CJD, and that there really wasn't any difference in the number of cases depending on when these patients were born. Um, are you going to talk a little bit about that, about what that means now? Okay. Um, and that all codon 129 polymorphisms were represented. So this led to the uh, estimation that about 1 in 2,000 uh, citizens of the UK are harboring uh, asymptomatic infection of prion disease. So this is why when you go to get blood in this country, they give you a laundry list of questions, some of which is, have you resided in the UK from this time to this time? And that's because they're trying to assess the risk of your exposure to BSE. Um, so changing gears a little bit to chronic wasting disease, uh, fortunately we really don't have BSE in this country, but unfortunately we have uh, a lot of what's called chronic wasting disease. This is the prion disease in deer, elk, moose, and caribou. Uh, that is a little unusual in that it tends to be fairly infectious amongst its own species. So essentially the BSE epidemic was man-made. Uh, we were kind of perpetuating the infection because we were refeeding uh, neural tissue back to cows and perpetuating the infection kind of like Kuru. Uh, chronic wasting disease can be transmitted between its own species through things like saliva, urine, and feces. So much more easily transmitted in the natural environment, which means that it spreads a lot more rapidly. And uh, this map is just a depiction of uh, cases of chronic wasting disease. You can see it's usually out in the Colorado, Wyoming area, but it has been spreading to Canada and also to some states in the East Coast. And then uh, in the last year or so, we've also uh, heard about different cases in Norway. Uh, we don't know exactly how it got to Norway, although there are some theories. One is that it's a sporadic occurrence and that just other countries haven't caught it yet. Um, the other possibility is that hunters use urine um, to attract other deer. Uh, and sometimes that urine can be imported into different countries. So it's possible that there is urine contaminated with CWD that was imported into Norway and that uh, these deer became ill that way. Um, chronic wasting disease is obviously very important to our country because uh, we want to avoid what happened in the UK with BSE. Uh, luckily, there's been no evidence of transmission of CWD to humans, but as with the case with iatrogenic CJD and with BSE, uh, we only really know that if we continue surveillance. So um, sometimes these incubation periods can be a decade or more. So we may not know right away whether or not it's being transmitted to humans. So this is why uh, the CDC work and the National Prion Disease Pathology Surveillance Center's work is so important. Because sometimes the only way to detect abnor abnormal or new prion diseases is by looking at brain tissue. So um, part of what the surveillance center does is it looks for atypical prion diseases that may uh, be suggestive that chronic wasting disease is being transmitted to humans. But again, to date, we don't have any evidence that that could happen. 